Hey guys, we're solving this bio paper today. <clears throat> this is the last paper in the paper 1 series for May June 2022, 9700 paper 13. Let's take a look at the threshold. So A was at 31, B was at 28. So comparatively, this was the easiest paper out of the rest. Out of 40 marks. C was a 24, okay, 21 and 18. So yeah, compared to the other papers, this was uh, apparently easier. So let's begin. Starting with question number one. Also guys, uh, make sure to subscribe to the channel. It will help me a lot and like the video as well that helps with the algorithm a lot good luck for your exams by the way on the 16th hopefully it goes well hoping to wrap this up within one hour number one the diagram shows a section through epithelium found in part of the respiratory system clearly that's the goblet cell what's the magnification of the diagram we know that the formula is m is equal to i by a so what you have to do is i don't have it printed over here um, you have to measure that 80 micrometer mark with a scale. Okay. So I'm going to go backwards. I know the answer is B. 315 to 18 to 10 to 6. Okay. So if you have it printed, this length should be equal to, this length over here should be equal to Two point eight centimeters. So this is the working m is equal to image length two point eight into ten to the power minus two meters divided by eighty micro is ten to the power minus six meters. So two point eight into ten to the power minus two divided by eight into ten to the power minus six gives you an answer of three thousand five. Uh, I messed up a little bit. It's fine. 2.8 into 10 power minus 2 divided by 80 into 10 to the power minus 6. Yeah, that gives you an answer of 350. Okay, so the magnification is 350. It should be about 2.8 centimeters. Four students were asked to match the function with the appearance of some cell structures in an animal cell. The functions were listed by number. A mRNA passes through the ribosome. We've seen this in paper 1, 1, and 1, 3. It's quite similar. It should be pretty easy. So this is basically a double membrane interspersed with pores. This is the nuclear envelope. So one should be X. Synthesis of polypeptides. This is ribosome. It's a non-membrane bound spherical structure. This is ribosome. Packaging of hydrolytic enzymes. This is the Golgi body. Golgi body. We had this in paper uh, one on as well. So the last one is actually Z. So two is actually C. And the second one is ribosome W. What about the other ones? This is central. It's in charge of making the mitotic spindle, if you recall. And this is basically the smooth ER. Okay. Synthesis of lipids. Three. This is also another common question. An experiment was carried out to separate the cell structures in an animal cell. The cells were broken open, the extract was filtered and put into a centrifuge tube. This tube was then spun so that the heaviest cell structure sank to the bottom first, forming pellet 1 as shown. The liquid above pellet 1 was poured into a clean centrifuge tube and spun again at a higher speed to separate the next heaviest cell structure. This cell structure sank to the bottom, forming pellet 2. This procedure was repeated twice to obtain pellet 3 and pellet 4, each counting a single cell structure. So you guys need to understand something. Okay, you guys need to understand something. Like, what is the basis of separation of these pellets? Mainly in the centrifuge machine. What happens is, the heaviest one, 
the heaviest one will be will sink to the bottom first okay so if we think about these guys uh, production of ATP this is the mitochondrion so this is a protein this is the ribosome digestion of organelles this is the lysosome basically production of mRNA basically The heaviest one sank to the bottom first. So the heaviest one production for mRNA. Basically, mRNA production and RNA production. RNA has two components: rRNA, ribosome RNA, and protein. So this is mainly produced by the nucleus. So this is pellet one. Okay, this is pellet two. This is pellet three, and this is pellet four. You will see this in other questions okay so the heaviest one is the nucleus itself see okay for ATP molecules are synthesized in mitochondria which sugar is found in these ATP molecules basically you need to know that ATP has ribose adenine and three phosphates so we have ribose not deoxyribose these are wrong these are hexo sugars so we have pentose sugar which is ribose specifically which shows a comparison that is not correct between a typical prokaryotic and typical eukaryotic cell. The DNA is not associated with histones in prokaryotes. True. Eukaryotes, it is uh, eukaryotic plant cell. It is true. No endoplasmic reticulum present in prokaryote. True. Endoplasmic reticulum is present. In prokaryotic cell, peptidoglycan cell wall. This is true in bacteria. We have peptidoglycan cell walls, and in plant cells, we have a cellulose cell wall. This looks true, so D should be the answer. All ribosomes are approximately 18 nanometers in diameter. All ribosomes are typically 22 nanometers in diameter. This is wrong because in plant cells, we also have 70 ribosomes. Okay, that's the tricky part. So did they mention the diameter of the ribosome in the course book? So it's like ATS and I don't think I have chapter oh I do. Ribosome. They didn't mention it, right? So it's 22 and 18 apparently. I know that it's around 20 nanometers approx the ATS ribosome. So yeah, the 70s would be slightly lower. But yeah, you guys need to understand that eukaryotic plant cells also have chloroplast, which is a prokaryote. So 18 nanometer ribosomes would also be present there, okay? So D is wrong. It is suggested that primitive prokaryotic cells may be ancestors of certain organelles in eukaryotic cells. Which organ is most similar in composition to a typical prokaryote? Mitochondria or chloroplast, okay? 6C. The concentration of reducing sugar in a solution can be found if an observational measurement is compared to a standard. Which observational measurement could be used to estimate the concentration of reducing sugar in an unknown solution? Okay, the color of the solution after 20 minutes, that works. The time for the first color change to occur this is also true like how long it takes for the color change to occur the rate of formation of solid particles honestly this isn't a measurement technique three is actually wrong it should be one and two only we mainly measure time because to measure rate we need to find out the change in solid particle per unit time that would be impossible to observe okay since this is an observational measurement the diagram shows three hexa sugars which show correctly shows examples of carbohydrates in which this three hexa sugars occur
Okay. So remember in alpha glucose, alpha is like this, the OH group is here. For beta glucose, the OH group is above. So one is actually alpha glucose. Okay? And two is actually beta glucose. So in cellulose, we'd get beta glucose two. In cellulose, we'd get beta glucose two. Now, three is actually fructose. So we'd get three in sucrose. That's why I'm going to go with D. And one is alpha glucose, which is present in amylopectin. Trehalose is a sugar that gives a negative result when tested in Benedict solution. So it's basically a non reducing sugar, which way is correct. So it has uh, one, it is deficient of one water molecule since uh, we formed a glycosidic bond. It's between A and B. Sugar that gives the same result in the Bendix test. Clearly sucrose, right? So 9 should logical be B. All is an artificial lipid. It is made by attaching fat acids by condensation to a sucrose molecule. A simplified diagram of all is shown. R represents the position where fatty acids would be attached. Okay. Humans cannot hydrolyze all estra. However, other animals may be able to do so. How many molecules of water would be needed to hydrolyze one molecule of olestra into fatty acids, fructose, and glucose? Hmm. Interesting. So guys, look at the answer. Basically, there will be one hydrolysis here since the R is a fatty acid. One over here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight fatty acids, fructose and glucose. So this glycosidic bond over here. So in total nine, ten C. Great. Moving on to eleven, which molecule contains at least one peptide bond? A is a triglyceride. C is basically disaccharide. It's between B and D. What is B? Look at this. C-O-N-H. 11B. Peptide bond. D is basically part of DNA. 12. Iron polymers and peptidyl transfers are both enzymes involved in protein synthesis. Which statements describe similarities between the two enzymes? They are both globular proteins. This is true. They are enzymes, globular proteins. They both have the same stru tertiary structure. Come on. This doesn't make sense. How? They are not the same enzyme. So 2 is wrong. They are both intracellular enzymes. This is true. They work inside the cell. RNA inside the nucleus. And peptidyl transfers in the cytoplasm. Okay. So for 13, what is a feature of competitive enzyme inhibition? Basically, it is reversible. It does not bind permanently to the active site. It does bind to the active site, but reversibly. That's the essential feature. And it can be reversed by increasing the substrate concentration. That is exactly why the answer is B. A is wrong because it's not permanent. It does not change the structure. The substrate and inhibitor are the same shape. <coughs> Actually, not the same. Uh, similar. But that's not mainly the um, feature. It's not mainly a feature of the inhibition. The feature is mainly that it's reversible by increasing the concentration of the substrate. <coughs> Batrachotoxin. It's a poison found in frogs in the Colombian jungle. The poison is to produce poison darts. The poison works by increasing the permeability of the cell surface membrane of nerve and muscle cells to sodium ions, which moves out of the cell. Four students made statements about how the poison affects the cells. <coughs> Water leaves the cells by osmosis, causing the cells to shrink. Okay, so this is a cell. It causes sodium ions to leave the cell. So Na plus leaves the cell. Water also follows. So yes, the cell does shrink. So I agree with 4-1. I don't agree with 4-2. This is wrong. It does not burst. So 1 is correct. 2 is wrong. When the sodium ions move out of the cells, 
the intercellular fluid has a more positive water potential than the extracellular fluid. That is true, which is why the water leaves. So one and three. I'm gonna go with one and three. When the sodium ions move out, so the extracellular fluid has a more positive water potential. Wrong. Four is wrong. <laughs> which process uses energy? ATP. Endocytes, exocytes. These are active processes. One and two. Facilitated diffusion is passive. Fifteen B. An indicator is colorless in acid and pink in alkali. Prolyphenolphthalein. <coughs> in an experiment, a petri dish of agar was prepared using an acidic solution of this indicator. A disc of agar one centimeter in di diameter was removed from the center to create a well. A white card showing circular marker lines, one centimeter was placed underneath the petri dish. So we had a petri dish. A disc of agar, one centimeter in a of a uh, diameter was removed from the center to create a well. Then we placed a white card. Then one cmk of alkali was put into the well and the stopwatch was start started. <clears throat> so it's pink in color currently since it's alkaline. A circular disc of pink color appeared and spread through the acre. It reached the first marker line in a short time but took longer to reach the second marker line and a very long time to reach the third marker line. What explains these observations? So initially, this solution was acidic, which is why it was white in color. But then over time, the pink color we placed in the middle, the alkaline solution spread over time. Okay, so obviously it's not facilitated diffusion because there are no carrier proteins involved. It is simply diffusing. And since the pink color is spreading, the indicator was already there beforehand. Okay, the pink color is spreading. This means that the alkaline solution is spreading. This is the only possible explanation because over time the pink spread. Okay, the indicator was already there everywhere in the whole petri dish. 17. The diagram shows a section of a glycoprotein molecule found embedded in a cell surface membrane. Each of the amino acids is represented by a small shaded circle. Which row shows a property of the amino acids found in the alpha helix and a property of amino acid Q? So basically, this region is hydrophobic. It's non-polar, essentially, this region in the middle. And this region outside is basically polar because it's pointing to the water. Okay, so this section in the middle is hydrophobic. The alpha helix is hydrophobic. So it needs to be non-polar. And the amino acid Q is actually polar since it's in the water itself, okay? By the way, I was thinking, guys, uh, how was your last year as an A-level student? How were your teachers? Did you self-study? Like, um, especially for, you know, teachers are very good at explaining topics. But I think there's always a deficiency in people explaining paper one questions. Because the, the marks team only has the solution, right? I was just wondering where you guys get the solutions. Because back in the day when I was an A level student, it was pretty hard to get the solutions. Like I had to think a lot. I was stuck most of the time, but took some time took some time to get the answers. Hopefully I can help you with that. Some cells are listed. Which cells can divide by mitosis? Bacterial cells divide by binary fission. So one is out of the question. Is between C and D. Cancer cells can do that, okay. Lymphocytes can also do that, cloning. 
RBC do not have nucleus, so 4 is wrong. The answer is C. Stem cells can do that. Which statements about mitosis are correct? At the end of tail phase, two nuclei are formed. Centrioles attach chromosomes to the spindle during metaphase. Chromatids are pulled apart during anaphase. 3 is correct. Chromatids are pulled apart during anaphase, just after metaphase. At the end of telophase, two nuclei are formed. This is also true. After telophase, cytokinesis occurs and two nuclei are formed. See this? Close it by mistake. Here you go. Nucleolus and nuclei uniform. This might be my uh, last video for some time. I'm gonna get quite busy. My second semester starts just started this week actually. I'm still gonna try to drop some content. Uh, the October November papers come out in January. So before then I still have to finish some of the May June 2022 content. I have some paper 4s, paper 2s, and paper 5s left, and the math papers. I'll try to complete those as soon as possible. So if you've been following my channel in 4AS, please support the channel 4A2. That would help me a lot. So 19, um, yeah. So at the end of the office, 2 nuclear form. This is correct. Centrioles attach chromosomes to the spindle during metaphase. This is wrong. This is wrong. 19C. Check this. Basically, according to this question, centrioles in the centrosome attach chromosomes to the spindle during metaphase. The centrosomes move to the opposite poles, where they form the poles of the spindle, and each centrosome reaches a pole, and the centrosomes help to organize production of spindle macrotubules. The spindle actually attached to the centromere. Chromosomes line up across the equator of the spindle. They are attached by their centromeres to the spindle. Okay. So this should actually be centromeres attach chromosomes to the spindle. Okay. Centromeres. That's the uh, wrong part over here. So that's why it's one and three. So this is the chromosome. This is the centromere. The centromere. Of the chromosome, the centromeres attach the chromosomes to the spindle over here. Okay, which statement about telomeres is correct? They allow cells in culture from any age of donor to divide a fixed number of times. Telomeres are at the ends of chromatids, basically. They're genes which are present on the five prime end of every chromosome, unpaired regions of DNA on the three prime end of every chromosome. They prevent introns and exons being lost from genes during cell divisions. Um, honestly, telomeres just prevent aging. That's their process. If you want a more clear-cut explanation, here you go.
the copying enzyme can't really run to the end of a strand. It stops a little short of the end. So we actually lose genes over time. So what is the main function of the telomere? It is to ensure that the ends of the molecules are included in the replication, not left out when DNA is replicated. Telomeres are found at the ends of chromosomes. They have been compared with the plastic tips at the end of shoelaces. They are made up of DNA with short base sequences that are repeated many times, multiple repeat sequences. They work by making the DNA a bit longer. They have no useful information but allow the copying enzyme to complete copying all the meaningful DNA. As long as extra bases are added to the telomere during its cycle, which is mainly done by telomeres, so they top up the telomeres. So according to this, the best possible answer, the single best answer is D. They prevent introns and extra ex exons being lost from genes during cell division. They're actually present on each end, both the 3' and 5'. They allow cells in culture from any age of donor to fi divide a fixed number of times. Uh, not really. That's not the best answer. 21. The time shows the stages of mitosis. Which is the correct order of sequences? Okay. Prophase. Metaphase. Anaphase, telophase. Clearly, this looks like Telo. This looks like Anaphase. They're moving. So it has. It is bound to be five fold by two. The end will be five fold by two, not two fold by. Sorry. It's two followed. Sorry. Five followed by two, right? Not two followed by five. So five comes first, then two. It's between B and C. Now between these, it's either 134 or 314. 134 or 314. So metaphase isn't really shown here, is it? So you guys just need to understand, during the nuclear cycle, basically, guys, uh, the chromosomes condense. So clear look, in 3, it is the least condensed state. So 3 has to come first. 21 should be C. So over time, it condenses, prophase occurs, metaphase occurs, anaphase, then telophase, okay? So the least condensed phase is basically your prophase. I mean, this is not prophase, really. This is actually interphase. So after interphase, we get prophase. It is the least condensed stage. 20. Which statement about the transcription, translation of a gene is correct? The non-transcript strand of DNA has a base sequence that is identical to the mRNA produced in transcribe transcription. Not really, not really, because DNA does not have uracil. mRNA has uracil. Get it? The template strand of DNA has a base sequence that is identical to the mRNA produced in same. It's no, no. It's complementary, okay, but not identical, and it does not have uracil. The non-transcript strand of DNA has a base sequence that is complementary to the tRNA molecules required in translation. Okay, this is the word. So, identical is a no-go. It's between C and D. So, let's see, guys. This is your DNA. You have a template strand. And the non transcribed strand. So let me cl clarify this from the course book since you're gonna follow it. Where, like, where do you get this info? Check this. So you have the transcribed strand or the template strand and the non transcribed strand. The template strand acts as a vehicle for mRNA production. Okay? So this is the template or transcribed strand. Using the transcribed strand, we are going to get the mRNA molecule.
So the mRNA molecule is actually complementary to the transcript strand. Okay, mRNA is complementary to transcript strand. So after you get the mRNA, you're going to get the tRNA. So this tRNA, right, it's complementary to mRNA. Who else is complementary to mRNA? The template strand, right? That is why, take a look at this. This is very important. Initially, we had the template strand. It was transcribed to form mRNA. Then from the mRNA, we got the tRNA. Required in translation, essentially. So 22 A and B are wrong because identical aren't proper options. It's just that in C and D, you need to understand the correct answer from here. Okay, it's a bit tricky. So I'll help you. For example, the non transcript strand of DNA has a base sequence that is complemented to the tRNA molecules required in translation. This is absolutely correct. The answer is C. Because think about it, check this. Look at the, for example, if this is the template strand, what if it was A, T, C, G, G? This is the non transcribed strand, it should be T, A, G, C, C. Now let's look at the mRNA. Okay. Look at the mRNA. The mRNA will be. U A G C C U A G C C Okay, so this is the mRNA basically. Now when the mRNA stays here, suppose this is the mRNA now. U A G C C. Let's get the tRNA in. tRNA. This is basically A U C G G. So this tRNA molecule, who is it actually complementary to? Check it. This one is complementary to this one. Do you get it? Because A U C G G. And here, the pink strand, the non-transcribed one, T-A-G-C-C, -C, get it? That's why the answer is C, tricky. You need to know this. Also, the non-transcribed strand, sorry, the template strand is uh, complementary to mRNA. Which statement about mRNA is correct? The primary transcript becomes modified by joining of introns. No, we get rid of introns, splicing. The primary transcript is synthesized and then modified to mRNA in the nucleus. Right, splicing occurs in the nucleus. mRNA contains nucleotides containing the sugar. No, no. Ribose, the bases in mRNA are held together by covalent bonds. No. The bases are held together. Which bases are they talking about though? Nitrogen is basis, right? So basically, mRNA where are they talking about though? Like here, the bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. The bases are attached to sugars by, um, you know, covalent bonds. But the but mRNA itself has phosphodiester bonds in between. So B is the best answer. That's true. mRNA contains nucleotides. C is wrong and A is wrong. The bases in mRNA are held together by covalent bonds. 
so they're talking about the bases bases are always held together by hydrogen bonds okay but a minor is single stranded so that's why it's vague it's very vague it's not right yeah, it's very vague like they they aren't telling us the location of the covalent bonds okay so b is the best answer 24. diagram shows part of a dna molecule which is labeled correct remember purines have double ring structures adenine and guanine so double ring with triple bond that's guanine single ring with triple bond that's cytosine c is basically double ring purine this is adenine d is a pyrimidine that's basically thymine which is labeled correctly C is adenine, so C is wrong. D is thymine, D is correct. So I'm gonna go with 24 D. Hopefully, that makes sense, guys. Double ring structures are purines adenine and guanine. Guanine has the triple bond, so A is G, guanine, and C is adenine, double ring structure purine with double bond. 25. The sequence of bases in DNA coding for the first state amino acids in the beta polypeptide of adult hemoglobin is shown. However, in hemoglobin C, hemoglobin C is basically one form of hemoglobinopathies. There is basically a structural defect in the hemoglobin moiety. Okay. It's a giant defect uh, which causes hemolytic anemia. It becomes this. What's the change really? Here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 the amino acids. CTC becomes TTC. Which changes occur to the amino acid sequence of normal hemoglobin to make it C? Basically, this C is converted to thymine. Okay? So, CTC to TTC. CTC to TTC. The normal acid, the normal amino acid glutamic acid turns to lysine. 25 is A. In sickle cell anemia, glutamic acid turns to valine. Diagram shows a plant organ. Which letter correctly labels the xylem? So this is the stem basically. So the answer is D. Remember in the stem for a dicot, the xylem is actually towards the center. In the previous variant, in my previous video, I was talking about this. I was talking about this specific picture. You need to memorize this, okay? Everything else will be fine then. In the leaf, remember the xylem is pointing towards the inside. The cross shaped region in the root is xylem, and in the leaf, it points upwards. Okay? Great. 27. The photomicrograph shows a vascular bundle found in plant organs. Clearly, y is the xylem, x is the phloem. Mm. This is not a root, guys. This is not a root. No way, no way. One is wrong. Because in the root I just showed you, it's a star-like structure. The xylem is over here. And phloem is like in these sections over here. Okay. So, this is not a root. Some of the cells in region X have very large numbers of mitochondria. This is true. Because it's uh, involved in unloading. Two is right. So region Y is made up of a number of different type of cells. Mm, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Xylem is made up of a different of different cell types. That's true. Like two is for sure true. I was a bit confused about three. But since two is correct, it has to be option C, right? Region Y is made up of a diff of different types of cells, but it's mainly the xylem. So this is basically the vascular bundle of the stem. This is the phloem. This is xylem. Here. This section basically. Okay. If you want more details, it's in chapter 7. Honestly, the worst chapter. I used to hate this when I was a student. Where is it?
xylem inside phloem here we have lignified fibers over here I gave you a more simplified figure basically it's lignified at the end like this okay so yeah it makes sense sorry anyway With changes to the water potential and the volume of solution flow and safety element occur when sucrose is moved from the flow and safety element to an actively dividing shoot tip. Okay. So sucrose is moved from the flow and safety to the shoot tip. So since sucrose is moved, the water potential in the flow and safety tube decreases. I mean water potential in the safety tube increases. Why? Mainly because you're getting a solute out from the cell it's like losing ions if you lose ions or if you lose solutes basically water potential increases and due to that excess water will now flow out of the flowing sieve tube into surrounding areas so the volume also decreases okay so there will be an increase in the water potential due to loss of sucrose and there will be a loss of water which results in a decrease in volume 29 which processes occur during the loading of sucrose into flow sieve tubes? Protons are pumped out of the cytoplasm of the components into its cell. 100% correct. 29 is 1 is correct. There is a higher concentration of protons in the symplastic pathway outside the component cell. What? This is the component cell. Cell wall. H plus is pumped in here. Then H plus moves down the gradient along with the help of the co-transporter. So the symplastic pathway refers to the intracellular, this pathway within the cell through the plasmodesmata, through the vacuoles. So there is a higher concentration of protons in the symplastic pathway outside the component cell. So if you want to recall this concept, here you go, this is the simplest and apoplast. The simplest pathway is basically the movement within the cell. Apoplast is the movement within the cell wall. Okay. So clearly the protons are present in the cell wall. This is a cell wall. So this doesn't make sense. It should have been the apoplast pathway. So I'm going to go with B. Protons are unable to move back. Wrong. It is able to move back with the co-transporter. A co-transporter acts as a care for protons and sucrose. Perfect. Perfect. 1 and 4. 30. The photomicrograph shows a section through a structure found in mammals viewed using a light microscope. Interesting. So it is in D. Because this is the endothelium. This is the endothelium. One layer thick. Okay. So the answer to this is basically C. Why is that? If you study this properly, this is tunica media. And the lumen is very large. So this is basically a vein. So in tunica in media of veins you have smooth muscle and elastic fibers but no collagen fibers okay so no collagen no collagen it's smooth and elastic to study this you can go through chapter 8 this section over here in tunica media of veins you only have smooth muscle and elastic fiber no collagen collagen is only the outer layer but if it was an artery if the lumen was much narrower the middle layer would have all three and the outer layer, mainly collagen and some elastic fibers. Okay. Great. This is a vein. So W contains smooth muscle and elastic fibers. Last 10 MCQs then. Which statement correctly links muscular 
or elastic arteries to their function. Basically, muscular or elastic arteries. Elastic arteries are close to the heart. They need to withstand the pressure. And muscular arteries are close to organs that they need to supply because they can constrict or dilate. The aorta is an example of a muscular artery. Wrong. It is an elastic artery. It's close to the heart. 31A is wrong. Arteries further away from the heart are muscular arteries. That is true as they transfer blood at higher pressure. This is wrong. You need elasticity to uh, transfer higher pressure. Elastic arteries expand when the heart contracts and then recall as the heart relaxes to maintain pressure. Exactly. Muscular arteries facilitate smoother blood flow than elastic arteries as they will expand and recall. This is wrong, guys. That's the purpose of a um, elastic artery. 32. What is the heart rate in beats per minute? Um, okay. So, this is one cardiac cycle. One cycle takes 0.8 seconds. So think about it. The beats per minute. Basically, in 0.8 seconds, we get one heartbeat. So in one second, we're going to get 1 by 0.8 heartbeats. So in 60 seconds, we're going to get 60 by 0.8 heartbeats. Let's see. 60 by 0.8. That gives us an answer of 75. Unitary method essentially. So I saw a comment in my video for paper 1 1. Someone was asking me for a detailed explanation of the uh, cardiac cycle. So let's talk about it right now for a bit. Okay. Come on. Let's go. So, guys, let's talk about this. So, what's the detailed explanation? Not much. I'm just going to talk about it for like two to five minutes. You don't need the phonocardiogram or the electrocardiogram. You mainly need this. So, honestly, according to the question they'll give you, this is one cardiac cycle, approximately 0.8 seconds. You need to know about four events. This event is basically the, you know, this is the atrioventricular valve closing. This event is the aortic valve opening. This event is the aortic valve closing again. And this event is the atrioventricular valve opening finally. Okay. You guys need to know this in details. So. What's happening in this section actually? From this moment, from this moment onwards, okay, to this section, the ventricle is full because it's in a closed space. Okay, in this region over here, the atria have just finished pumping blood into the ventricles now the ventricle is just about to contract there's a very short time span where the ventricle is about to contract and when that happens pressure inside the ventricle increases but it is just high enough to close the atrioventricular valves the tricuspid and bicuspid valve but not high enough to open the aortic valves but suddenly when the pressure crosses a threshold what happens is the aortic valve opens and the ventricle contracts. Now the blood from the ventricle enters the aorta, which is why the aortic pressure increases suddenly. But over time, the blood decreases, decreases, and after a certain limit, when the blood pressure is lower in the aorta, the valves that are open will close to prevent backward flow. And now again, you know about the pacemaker, right? The sinatrial node. It will send impulses to the atria to begin contraction again since the pressure in the ventricles will decrease significantly. And when the atria receives the signal and starts contracting... Okay, by the way, right now the ventricle is empty. We don't have blood in the ventricle. Now the atria starts contracting again. 
but before that there is a time span where the atria is actually you know uh, filling filling up essentially right after ventricular contraction the atria is filling up and then the atria contracts okay the atria contracts and then the cycle repeats again okay so let's take a look at these diagrams now So this is the region where both are closed. This is also the region where both are closed. Okay. And the ventricle is full here. But it's kind of empty here. Okay. So let's see. Look at the ventricle volume. It's full over here. Then it contracts to let everything go. But then right after the atria starts contracting, blood enters into the atria and into the ventricle and it becomes full again over here and then it contracts again so see if you understand these uh, stages these you don't need these i basically learned this in physiology in med school you don't need these details all right you just need to know about the events and what's happening where and you need to identify the lines okay like which one is the aortic pressure which one is the ventricular pressure which one is the atrial pressure what happens to the volume essentially if they ask you when is the ventricle empty honestly this region this is where the ventricle is empty so it's full over here and it's empty over there so i'm gonna correlate these uh, phases with the picture over here so look at this uh, purple section over here the purple section this one This corresponds to atrial contraction. The atria is contracting over here, which is why there's increased uh, atrial pressure. Now, this blue section over here, this is where, oh, by the way, during atrial contraction, the ventricle is filling up, actually. Okay, so here, the ventricle is achieving maximum volume. Th that's basically this section, atrial systole. Atrial contraction, the ventricle is achieving maximum volume. Then, uh, we get isovolumetric contraction. We get isovolumetric contraction. In this stage, essentially, the ventricle is a closed chamber. It is full. The pressure builds up, so both the valves are closed. Both this and this. And when the pressure exceeds a certain volume, the aortic valve opens. Okay, the aortic valve opens, and then stage three begins. Say stage three is basically ventricular ejection. After ejection, when the pressure uh, falls suddenly, falls slowly, then the, to prevent backflow, the aortic valve closes again. This is called isovolumetric relaxation. That's stage four. And here the ventricle is basically empty, right? It doesn't have anything. And stage five is atrial filling again because now, guys, the aortic valve is closed, but the atrioventricular valve opens again, and blood from the atria, and blood from the supravena cava, and the you know pulmonary veins enter into the atria that's stage five so the aortic the pressure in the atrium slightly increase and then a ventricular filling occurs which is basically the last stage stage six this is a natural process honestly like when the blood enters from the superior vena cava inferior vena cava and from the uh, pulmonary you know, pulmonary veins to the atria. Uh, naturally, due to the blood entering naturally, some of it will enter the um, ventricles, but just a bit, okay? Just a bit. And then that process will be extended. More blood will enter the ventricles in stage 6, and then the atria will contract, okay? So most of the atrial and ventricle filling occur quite naturally. Do you guys understand? And that is the diastole. So basically, the atrial systole occurs at the end. Okay, right here. Stage one is basically atrial systole, and the ventricular systole is basically stage three mainly, but it also takes that stage two part. So we get the lab sound. Okay, why do we get the lab sound? This is a very good diagram. This is amazing, honestly. You can study this diagram. We get the lab sound due to the closure of the atrioventricular valve and we get the dub sound why due to the opening of the atrioventricular valve okay there are more heart sounds but you don't need to know those so that's all guys 
So this is the time span for the atrial systole and this is the time span for the ventricular systole over here. Okay, it happens right after the atrial systole until, look, until the um, basically wait, let me show you. So the atrial systole corresponds to this region. It corresponds to atrial contraction. And the ventricular systole, it will occur just afterwards and until the aortic valve closes. So we can say it like this, like uh, ventricular systole will occur right after the atrioventricular valve closes and until the aortic valve closes again after opening. See, it opened and then closed again. That's the region of aortic, the ventricular system. And aortic system just occurs till the atrioventricular valve closes. And, you know, it's a region just before, you know, you, you're going to see that the pressure of the atria rises just before, okay? So according to this, to this diagram, we can fill the, that information up, honestly. Like, this is the region. This is the region of ventricular systole and this is the region for um, atrial systole this small region okay get it this is the lump this is the dub over here dub okay 33 i hope that's clear the one who wanted explanation sorry i can't do another video um hopefully that clarifies i'll link this in the um, description okay which events occur during ventricular systole? Great. Basically, during ventricular systole, the semilunar or the aortic valves clearly open. The semilunar valves open. Uh, the atrial ventricular valves <clears throat> It has to be, okay, 3 is correct for sure. So any option without 3 is wrong. The muscles in the ventricle was relaxes. That doesn't make sense, right? It's a contraction. So two is wrong. It can't be two. So the option is C. So why is one right? The atrial ventricular valves close. Right. During, check this. During ventricular systole. Right after systole begins over here. Honestly, the semilunar valves will open or the aortic valves will open and the atrioventricular valve closes. That is 100% correct due to the increased pressure, right? Due to the increased pressure, it call, pre to prevent backflow, the atrioventricular uh, valves uh, close to prevent backflow to the atria, okay? So it's 1 and 3 basically. 34. Which reactions take place in the capillary in the lungs? Okay, in the lungs. Carbonic acid is formed from carbon dioxide and water. Honestly, uh, this is what happens in the lungs. This reforms to form H2CO3, and then this forms H2 and CO2, which we release to the alveoli. Then hemoglobinic acid breaks down to form H plus and HB. What else? Carb amino hemoglobin breaks down to form hemoglobin and CO2. What else? What else? What else? And hemoglobin plus oxygen combines to form oxyhemoglobin. Carbonic acid is formed from carbon dioxide and water. Wrong. That's the opposite reaction actually. One is wrong. Carb amino, hemoglo carb amino hemoglobin is formed from carbon dioxide and hemoglobin. That is also wrong. Carb amino hemoglobin actually breaks down. Hemoglobinic acid is formed from hemoglobin and hydroinons. No, that happens in active tissues, not the lungs. Hemoglobinic acid actually breaks down to form hemoglobin and hydroinons. Carbon dioxide and water form from hydrogen carbon ions and hydrogen ions. True. One is fine. Only D. Last six. Which features are important for the process of diffusion of oxygen out of an alveolus? Okay. Epithelium is permeable to respiratory gases. Must. Two is very important. We need two. 
moist squamous epithelium present. Substance to reduce surface tension. Honestly, four is not a part of the answer. Surface tension prevents collapse. Okay, it should be A because uh, it is permeable to respiratory gases. It is one cell thick. The pressure forces blood red blood cells through the capillaries due to the high pressure and yeah the moist squamous epithelium helps to do so this is very important you will see this in the course book in chapter 9 uh, where is this actually this part I don't think this was something you knew beforehand. Basically, you can read this section over here. Like, how is the diffusion gradient maintained? Mainly by blood continuously coming in and air being ventilated continuously. That's the logic, honestly. I guess this is too... Um, too it might be too complicated for you guys. But remember that it can't be 4. So, we get rid of these. And we need 2. It needs to be permeable, okay? So blood pressure forces RBC through the capillaries. This is the alveolus. We want O2 to come in. This is the capillary. So it's permeable, all right. There is moist squamous epithelium. Squamous is very so permeable. Squamous epithelium is uh, perfect for diffusion. Squamous means flattened epithelium. You will see that in alveoli and endothelium. And blood pressure does force the red blood cells uh, through capillaries. Okay, so essentially here, squamous is the keyword. Okay. Next, last five. Student viewed three slides at low magnification and high. Each slide was a section through a different airway. Okay. So to do this, you can just match this table over here. We have goblet cells and cartilage only in bronchi and trachea, okay? Nowhere else. You have smooth muscle and cilia in bro the bronchial, terminal bronchial, but afterwards you don't. So let's match it with this. Many goblet cells. Three is likely to be trachea or bronchi. It can't be bronchial. Three can't be bronchial. Understood. It has to be trachea bronchus. Next, very few goblet cells. So goblet cells are only present on the trachea and bronchus. Okay. But here's the thing. Very few goblet cells, like in the initial part of the bronchial, which is just after the bronchus, few goblet cells may be present. Very few. All right. Now, cartilage. Okay. This is the determining factor. Cartilage is present in bronchus or trachea only. So, let's see. Slide one, it needs to be bronchus or trachea. But here's the thing, irregular arrangement. In trachea, we have a regular arrangement of C-shaped cartilage. So since it's irregular, it has to be bronchus. That's where the answer is A. See if you guys get it. If it was regular, it would have been tra the answer C. 37. Which terms can be used to describe the role of mosquitoes in transmission of malaria? So basically, it's a vector. The female anophyse is a vector of malaria. That's it. Malaria uh, parasite is the pathogen, right? It's a protoctist. So the mosquito is only a vector, merely a vector. Rheumatoid arthritis. This is an autoimmune disease. It is common in women. What is an autoimmune disease? Basically, it's a disease 
where the cell's own immune system fails to recognize the self antigens and creates antibodies against them. It is basically a type 3 hypersensitive reaction. The table shows five different monoclonal antibodies, how they work. Inflammation and swelling of joints are. We use the drug CTLA4. So let's see, inflammation and swelling of joints are symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. The cytokine TNF alpha activates cells in the immune system leading to death of cells in the joint. It affects the joint mainly, joint pain, morning stiffness. Which types of maps could be used to treat rheumatoid arthritis? Let's see. Binding to proteins on the cell surface and triggering the immune system. This would actually make it worse. Blocking molecules on the cell surface that inhibit T lymphocytes. This will also make it worse. The problem are the the problem is the immune system, cells of the immune system, right? They're the problem. Uh, so, if we block the cell, if we block the cell surface, uh, block the molecules on cell surfaces that inhibit T lymphocytes, that means T lymphocytes would be activated more, which would cause more inflammation. We want to reduce inflammation by reducing the activation of lymphocytes and cells of the immune system. Okay, so if you block molecules that inhibit T lymphocytes, that means more T, T lymphocytes will be produced and this would make it worse. More inflammation would be caused. Blocking cell signaling receptors that trigger cell division. Okay, let's think about this. We're not sure, but 1 and 2 are completely wrong. 4. Binding to antigens on cell surfaces and releasing a drug. Blocking cell signaling uh, receptors that trigger the immune response. 5 is clearly a good option because the problem is the cytokine, TNF alpha, uh, which activates the immune system leading to the death of the cells in the joint. Uh, we attack our own cells in RA. So 5 is correct for sure. I need 5. Because if we block the cell signals that trigger immune response, an immune system will not be generated. So we need 5. And I told you that 1 and 2 won't be accepted. 1 and 2 won't be accepted. So the answer is D. So I was a bit confused about 3 and 4. But here's the logic. 4-4. Four, four, binding to antigens on cell surfaces and releasing a drug. This is how the monoclonal antibody works. Yeah, the drug can work. Which actually prevents inflammation and swelling. So 4 is totally fine. What about 3? Why is 3 wrong? Blocking cell signaling receptors that trigger cell division. Basically guys, uh, cell division is mainly done by T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes which actually result in antibody production. But you know, inflammation can also be caused by other cells like, you know, uh, natural care cells, macrophages. So, uh, we don't need cell division for inflammation. There are other mechanisms of cell division. So just because you blocked a pathway, that uh, trigger cell division doesn't mean the immune response can be prevented okay so three is a very vague way so it's four and five they're the best ways okay next a person's blood group is determined by the antigens present on the red blood cells i talked about this in paper one one and one two which blood can be given to a person with group a so basically uh for group a it's important that we look at the antibody of the recipient. The antibody of the recipient. In the person with blood group A, the antibody is anti B. So we cannot give blood that has antigen B on it. That is why you cannot give B group because this antigen would react with the anti B. You cannot give A B group because this B antigen would react with A B. So you cannot give A B. You cannot give B. You can give A and O. O can be given to anyone because it has no antigens. Okay, 39 is B. AB can receive blood from anyone because it doesn't have any antibodies. O can receive blood from only O. A can receive blood from A and O. B can receive blood from B and O. Okay, that's the logic. But according to this graph, B cannot receive blood from A and AB because it has anti-A antibodies which may react with the antigens. And A can only receive from A and O because, or it can't receive 
A, B, and B because it has B antibodies which would react with the B antigens that it would receive from the donor. Last one. Some of the events during the primary immune response are listed. Phagocytosis of foreign microbe, macrophage and antigen presentation. Remember, this is a must. This must occur at the first stage. That is why B is the answer. Antigen presentation is a must. There are three antigen presenting cells. Macrophages, dendritic cells and B lymphocytes. Some T lymphocytes will become T killer cells. The T helper cells divide by mitosis to produce lymphocyte clones. A T helper cell with a complementary receptor binds to the antigen being presented. Okay, so one happens first. Then after the antigen is presented, the T cell receptor, we call it the T cell receptor, binds to the antigen. So four comes second. So this T helper cell then produces many clones. Okay. And then this proliferates other T killer cells. And then it also stimulates other B helper cells. That's how it works. It stimulates these by using interleukin uh, 2 and interleukin 4 and 5 mainly. Okay, that's what the T helper cells do. All right, guys, uh, you don't need that many details about immunology. I just did it last sem, so I know a lot. Okay, anyway, hope you guys like the content. And if you did, make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'll link the video for uh, May, June 2022. Paper 1 1 up here and the uh, video for May June 2022 variant 1 th uh, 2 down here and the playlist for paper 1 up here. And if I've made any uh, mistakes, please feel free to comment down below. Okay, see you guys.